Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Fall is a great time to plant a tree. Today, we're going to show you how. Also, raised beds make great gardens and they look good too. Today, we're going to see how we built ours. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation, the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Wes Hopper. Wes is a certified arborist right here in Shelby County. And Peter Richards, our great producer, will be joining us later to show us how we built the raised beds. All right, Wes. Planting a tree, fall is the right time to do that, right? Fall is a great time to do that. Okay. And we have our spot right here, right? Uh, this perfect. This flag, a flag <laughs> spot. All right. So what do we need to get started when it comes time to planting a tree? Uh, first, we need to pick a tree out. Okay. Which this is a golden rain tree that was rescued from the nursery. Okay. I like and we need a shovel. Okay. We have and, shovel. And uh, just a few other things, some garden soil mix, you know, that's designed for you know trees and shrubs. Okay. And uh, that's about it. Keep All it simple. Right. Okay. So you want to go ahead and get started? Yeah. Can I move this out? This tarp. This tarp. Uh, we got the tarp okay. just to put the dirt on top of, so we can have a clean work site. Ah, uh, supposed to be like a certified arborist, right? You want a clean you site. You gotta want a clean site. Okay. You want your planting hole depth just about even with the soil level in the pot. Okay. And you'll notice in this this pot, it's a container tree, and there's other types of planting uh, procedures also, uh, planting styles. You can have a bald and burlap, a container grown tree, or even a bare root tree. I prefer bare root. It's easier. Okay. Um, Yep, so we're going to go about that depth right there. And one of the things that I wanted to mention about these container grown trees is, like this one here, it's been at the nursery for quite some time. It, these straps that are on here yeah, have girdled almost girdled it. Yeah. it. And you can see where there's indentions there. Yeah. The tree will recover. Like I said, we rescued this tree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, I, would, I would imagine here in ne the next couple of years, this is going to be a beautiful tree. This is where we want to plant it. This is where we're going. Our depth again is like so. Okay. Our planting hole will be slightly shallow. So this, the flare of this tree will be standing up above the ground level. Because we need to see the root flares, right? I want people to understand that. You need to see the root flare. You don't want to bury that root flare. Okay. It's a different type of tissue on the outer part of the bark that's not that, that is exposed to the elements versus what's down below the soil. And this ground is extremely hard. <laughs> We may not get this tree planted today. <laughs> go get you a good workout. <laughs> you want to go ahead and remove this for you? Sure. All right. This is a typical construction site, though, where the soil has been changed, modified, so to speak. Now, do you believe in shaving the size? I know some people do that. <laughs> How do you feel about that? As we, if you shave it, say, like if you planted the, tr the tree with a tree spade, those blades that go down kind of glazes that the edges of that soil. Yeah, I've seen that burn. And so we kind of like to chop it up a little bit. Because okay. Okay. you want to make sure those roots, right, will get out. You want to make sure okay. those roots have room to expand right. and grow outward. And since we know that container is flat on the bottom, okay. we're going to make this flat on the bottom too. All right. We don't want to add a lot of this soil mix to the bottom. With this dense soil that you have here now, if we put this garden soil mix in the bottom of this, this planting hole, it's gonna hold too much water. Right. right. And the tree will succumb to lack of oxygen. Okay. We're somewhere we in this? that area right there. Yeah. I would say that we're right there at it. All right. Now, I'm not gonna just pull this out of the bucket. Okay. It's been in here so long. Okay. I'm gonna take my, uh, my pruners, and I'm just going to cut this off. You got to hold it. I got it. Okay. There you go. 
Wow, that's what does look good, doesn't it? Yeah, got a lot of feeder roots on here. You'll notice that these roots that are on here, these are the roots that do the absorption of the minerals and water okay. and nutrients, whatever the so I'm gonna slice this up just a little bit. I'm not gonna go crazy on it. Okay. This root right here that's growing around, that is an example of a girdling root, a root that has been confined in a growing space that's growing around the, the trunk of this tree. Sometimes they can graft themselves back into it, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can cut off the, the sap flow to the circulation okay. I mean, for the rest of the tree. So I'll probably take and nip that right there. Okay. It's gonna be fall soon. I'll go ahead and do that now. I'm not gonna cut it all the way back here because I think it's already started grafting. And it probably has some other shooter roots that are coming down off of it. But let's let's do this wow, okay. and we'll slow it down. Okay. I'm gonna measure the planting hole. What do you think? That looks pretty good. Yes, I think good. we're right in there. All right. All, right. all right. Now, let's point this tree in the direction that looks the most aesthetic at this point. What do you think? That direction? We got most of foliage uh, yeah, facing the parking way, lot? Yes, I would think so. I will. Okay, that looks good to me. I think it looks good. All right, I said that I was going to do some Kinda slices up, right. on this uh, right here. I'll bring out my little trusty pocket knife. <laughs> you come prepared. Come prepared. I'm just going to slice it. I'm not going to go too crazy. Okay. Just going to give it some help encourage these roots to expand out a little bit. They want those roots to get out into that native soil. Yes. Yeah. Now I can feel some serious roots inside this as I'm trying to cut. I bet this thing's been in this container for two years. All right, so it goes back into the soil. Goes back into the, the earth. Okay. And we gently tip this down in here to help okay. the tree stay stable in the right. soil. Tapping it down. Tapping it down. Gotcha. So what's a good pH for a tree, Wes? So, but normally, deciduous trees, good neutrals pH. If your pH is off, however, it's very difficult to change. Looks good. Ta-da! Looks good. Now, back to the guy. These guying straps. This at the nursery, this is a good idea to keep this tree with a nice straight trunk. It's got a nice straight trunk. I want to cut some of these off. Okay. You know what? I noticed that this is not connected at the bottom, so I want to take all these off. Okay. So this uh, wasn't doing anything anyway. Oh uh, yeah, it's just there. And let's you add let's add some of this. Number one, this is some good soil. Now, why are we adding the soil to somebody who might be asking? It's going to break down and uh, create nutrients for the tree. Okay. Not to mention that when you get through, it looks good. Now, I'm getting around this, but I will move that. Okay. keep our trunk flare exposed. A lot of times, and in the old days, they say with a tree that had been hand dug and planted, you lost some of the roots and you want to prune the canopy okay. to, to match the root system. We don't do that. I've heard that before. The only thing that we're going to do today is cut off this dead stub, okay. and this dead twig. And there's one at the top, so get this one up here first. Give it a little clip. Now, when you're pruning, trees have what we call a branch collar. And that you just want to follow that flow of vascular tissue, and you have a swelling around the branch right here. Okay. You want to cut just outside of that branch collar. Okay. Not too deep, not too flush. You don't want to damage that vascular tissue. Okay. And this is really easy to see. Get it? Yep. I just want to be gentle. Oh, there it goes. Yep. All right, Wes, we definitely appreciate that demonstration of some yes. good information. And don't worry, folks, we will get it watered. It'll be watered. All right.
Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, so we have Peter, our producer, out here today. Good to see you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, look, uh, this, these raised beds have been out here, what, about two or three years? About three years, yeah. Okay. Uh, they've really served a good purpose for us, too, for our uh, gardening demonstrations. So a lot of people are interested in raised beds, and they're interested in building raised beds, of course. So how did you go about building the raised beds here? Yeah, well, these are actually the second set of raised beds I built. I built a set for home. Okay. Um, and used the same pattern here. Okay. And... Uh, Basically what it is, is it's just, it's just what you see. It's just uh, landscape timbers that are nailed together. Um, and you have to make sure that you get some good drainage so that you don't rot your timbers. But other than that, I find that these beds last, uh, these last about 10 years um, with the landscape timbers. You, if you build them, there's a couple different kinds of raised beds you can build. Okay. One is you can just take dimensional lumber. So a two by 10 or two by 12, set it on edge, connect the corners and fill it with dirt. Okay. Um, but those, uh, those will tend to rot out faster okay. uh, because it has direct contact with the dirt. Then at the other extreme, you can build them out of uh, concrete block or stone. I've seen those. Uh, and those will last forever. Forever. Right. right. But these will last about 10 years before the wood rots out and you have to replace them. All right. So in order to get this ready, though, then you have to kill some of the Bermuda that we have here. Yep. Yeah, we went through and uh, Mr. D actually did <laughs> a demonstration. <laughs> he did. Uh, we killed the Bermuda <laughs> underneath where we were going to put the beds. Um, and once the Bermuda was dead, we started to do the construction. And what okay. we did is we dug a trench uh, around where above, or rather below the wall, uh, where it was going to be. We dug a trench down. It's about uh, six to eight inches deep, about eight inches wide. Um, I tend to use the width of my shovel because that's an easy way to get the same yeah, width all the way around. So anyway, you, you do the trench. Um, and then when you're done with that, you take landscape fabric and uh, line the trench with landscape fabric. You don't want to cut it narrower so it just lines the trench. You want to have all the extra and put the extra to the inside. You're going to use that later. Uh, and then you take the landscape fabric, that little, the trench with landscape fabric in it, you put gravel on top of that, about four inches of gravel. Mm -hmm. uh, and the purpose of the gravel throughout the bed is to just keep the water away from the wood yeah. because wet wood rots. Yes. So if you can keep your wood dry, then it'll last a lot longer. It's half the battle is keeping the wood dry. Yep. Okay. And so anyway, you take, you put that uh, gravel down, you tamp it down so it's compacted and flat. That's one of the purposes of the landscape uh, fabric is to keep you from just packing the gravel into the dirt. Okay. Um, anyway, once you have that done, you go ahead and lay out your bottom row of timbers, which the top of the bottom row of timbers is going to be just about at ground level. Okay. So you do one row that's below ground. Um, and then you drive rebar in every eight feet. It's kind of acts as na a big nail to hold the hold the timber to the ground. Um, and then from there, you just start stacking up the timbers. Um, and every every row of timber you wanna have set back about a quarter of an inch um, because the dirt that you're holding back has a lot of force. Okay. And uh, especially if you have a really long a wall like in our longer bed, um, you're gonna have a problem with the dirt will actually bow the wall out over time. Mm especially when it's wet, it's extremely heavy and produces a lot of force against that wall. So one of the things you want to do if you have a longer wall is you need to uh, anchor that wall in the middle somehow. And with our larger bed, we actually tied the two walls together. We have a timber that runs under the ground from one side to the other okay. on the okay. second row of timbers. And so that'll keep it from bowing out. Mm -hmm. um, and when you are nailing it together, you, use, you need to use a, a spike. Just regular nails won't do it. And you want to use galvanized hardware all throughout okay. because otherwise it'll uh, rust. Right. Yeah. Um, and you want your spike to be long enough that it has to be able to go through the board that you're nailing, mm. through the next board, and into the board underneath that. Mm. So um, we, we used, I can't remember, somewhere around eight inch spikes. And a spike every two to four feet, depending right. on what you have. And you just keep building it up. I like to keep, as I'm going through the wood and uh, picking the wood for the next course of timbers. I always look, if I find a really nice piece of wood, I set it aside and then I use that for the top to make okay. it look 
to uh-huh. make it look the best. So let me ask you this though. Yeah. So somebody's probably thinking that's a lot of hard work, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> to build to build the three beds that we did, uh, there are three of us working on it, and we wow. didn't. You know, we probably had a couple hours a day that we could work between our other responsibilities here at the station, but it took us uh, probably two weeks to build them. Wow. Okay. About two yeah. weeks. About two weeks. Yeah. Right. Now, before you uh, dig a trench, of course, you have to call 811, right? You right. want folks to do that. Yes, we did that here, and uh, the 811 guy came out. We have, yeah. because of where we are here, there's a lot of high voltage electrical and just television signal cables that are running around sure. under the ground here, and we just wanted to know where they all were because uh, you know the worst thing that could happen is we're driving that rebar four feet into the ground and we hit a high voltage line. Ah. And that's, yeah, that's very dangerous. Yeah. You know, other things, you know, if we could have, you know, if we went through a, a TV cable, you know, that's, you know, it's not deadly, right. but it could knock us off the air and that wouldn't be good either. That's not good. We want folks to see the family plot. Yeah, yeah see, exactly. We want that yeah. to happen, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, how's the drainage here? Yeah. The drainage in the garden itself, yeah, in the garden it itself. drains really fast. Real fast. Okay. Um, but something that we did is uh, when, as we're filling, filling the beds with dirt. Okay. Um, and what and what kind of soil mix did you use to fill the beds? We with actually the used half of just screen soil. Okay. That's what it's called, which is just clay. Okay. You know, just what whatever they dug up. Okay. Um, and then the other half we used a garden mix, which has a lot of. Uh, a lot of additives, you okay. know, has bark and things like that. Okay. Which it's interesting to note when you do that, the garden mix is going to eventually break down and be great soil, but it's going to take it a year or so to actually break right. down. So the first year, if you have really poor results in your raised bed, don't worry, yeah. it'll get better. But what we did is, as we were adding the as we were adding the soil, that's where the other all the extra landscape fabric comes in handy. Okay. Is what you do is you take the landscape fabric, you fold it up against the timbers and then you put maybe an inch or two of gravel just inside right. the timbers and then you have the landscape fabric and then you have all your soil. Okay. And so the landscape fabric keeps the soil from getting into the gravel. The gravel just lets it all drain. And so once again, you're just trying to keep the wood dry. Okay, oh, so that's what we're seeing back here. Yeah, okay. right there. Okay, wow, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, raised beds are good too because you get it off the ground. And instead of having to actually plant in the soil itself, right? Uh, you can make these as high as you want to make them too, right? right? Well, I like the fact that you can sit on and them. I like, like and we I was are. about to mention, then I can you can sit, sit here. here. Yeah. yeah, I can sit here and work in the garden. And yeah, I, I like that. And I have to be down on my knees. Because it makes it a lot easier for you to get down here and, and weed, of course. Yeah. Um, is there anything else we need to know about the raised beds from your perspective? Um, not really. It's a fun project. It's okay. going to take a while to do. Um, the My raised bed in my garden at home is about seven years old now. Okay. And it's starting to show some rot. Okay. Now is it the, the same size? Uh, no, it's it's a little bigger. It's a little bigger. But it's, you know, it, I'm starting to see some rot in the timbers, especially the top row okay. of timbers because the soil actually touches the timbers there. So probably next year I'll have to go in and replace the top row of timbers. Okay. Uh, but it's it's been very stable. It works, it works really good. All right, Peter, we appreciate you being here. Well, thanks. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. All right, this is our Q&A session. Peter, you join another with us, okay? I will. All right. Here's our first question. I have ivy growing up one of my trees. Is that okay or will it harm the tree? Wes, what do you think about that? I don't like ivy in the I tree. I don't either. Uh, as a tree climber uh, and a risk assessor, I can't see uh, any defects in the, in the tree's canopy behind the ivy. So I can't give it a proper diagnosis. As, as a climber, it's hard to get around in a tree that has uh, the, the vines and ivy growing in it. It's the vines hold animals, uh, raccoons, rats, bees, snakes. So we don't like to work with trees and the vines. Uh, sometimes the vines can look cool, but personally, I don't like the vines in the tree. Personally, you don't like. Them. However, vines do make up about 25% of the natural forest. Okay, <laughs> all right. Peter, anything to add to that? No, I just say, do the vines hurt the trees? Certain vines do. Certain vines uh, will grow like. Uh, wisteria, for example, yes, it'll grow and grow around the the tree's canopy and constrict it. Right. You know, 
and, and cause deformities in the in And the, Cut Zoo uh, will actually do that as well. Cut Zoo will yeah. too. Right, because you know, I mean, they're going to be competing for the same thing. Yes. I mean, sunlight, nutrients, moisture. Kudzu is the only one that I can think of, uh, not the Boston Ivy, but the kudzu can actually grow over the canopy mm -hmm. of a tree and cause the photosynthesis sure. process to stop and cause the tree to decline right. and, and die. Right, because it's going to restrict sunlight Yes, you know, for those leaves. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you're right. So your an my answer is no. No. No ivy. Okay. No ivy, he says. No All ivy. right. So here's our next question. Will oak galls kill my tree? And what causes them? And Peter, we just so happen to have a certified operist with us today. So yes. Wes, yes. I know you get this question a lot because we get it at the office about the oak galls. Yeah, and this year has been the worst year of ah, my entire that. career that I've seen the, the gall. The entire gouty, career? Oh, entire career. Wow, okay. Uh, the gouty oak gall in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, up north as in my travels uh, uh, through Illinois, I noticed that there was some, some uh, Fatalities with the trees with the, directly related to the gall. Okay. So I had to say uh, yes. There's it's this, it's going to be a problem, and they're primarily in the cherry bark oaks, which is the most common oak tree that we have in the mid south okay. here. Now, what causes the galls? Though? The galls are caused from the egg laying of the centipede wasp. It's a wasp. The, it's a tiny. It's a tiny wasp. It's about the size of the end of an ink pen. It's when the, the the insect lays its egg into the twig of the tree, mm -hmm. it causes the damage in, in the pheromones with it, the egg, egg injection causes the tree to respond and develop new growth, therefore causing the gall to form. Okay, I got it. And it's actually a container for the eggs to grow. Okay, okay. So it's like a shell All in right. a sense. That actually makes sense, okay. Yeah, I have a sample. And you actually have some, yeah. yeah, we can look at it, okay. Yeah, this would be your gaudy oak gall. And as you can see, it's large, it's heavy. <laughs> and in the past, uh, it's, it's more of an anesthetic problem. Of course, you don't want these to fall out of the tree and conk you in the head. <laughs> All right. But there's about 50 different species in, in, in the United States that causes this particular gall. However, with the centipede wasp, there's actually about 700 different species mm -hmm. that, are, that are gall makers, but for this particular Type gall is about, is about uh, so. There's nothing that you can really do about the wasp, right? Not in my opinion. Okay. No, nothing okay. that's really effective. That's effective. Right, okay. Because this insect is doesn't feed on the tree. Okay. It's it only a uh, uh, uses the tree for the the egg laying. Right. And the the inside this gall right here, this gall will hold the uh, the larvae and the adult for up to two years. Wow. And so when they leave, this this is where the problem comes in. When they leave this stage, they can cause another type of gall, like the apple gall, <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a strange process. It takes a, it's a lot of reading to understand yeah. this particular insect. It's very complex. And then when they hatch from this stage right here, which they could be in this form for two years, they could be in this form for maybe three to six months, Jeez. and then when they leave that stage, they There's can another cause stage? another type of gall. Oh my goodness! Uh, the the marble gall. Mar now the problem that we're having with this gall is the population of this insect. And you can see some damage right here from the egg laying, okay. from the open positor, but I have another sample here. And I've seen that before. Yeah. I have. This is actually a crepe myrtle and this is actually cicada damage. Mm -hmm. But the damage is the same. And you can see where that egg laying, now the ovipositor, I'll explain, is like a hypodermic needle. Mm -hmm. And it goes under the bark and it injects the egg into the tree. Hmm. Interesting. And these these eggs fertilize herself. They don't. Okay. It doesn't take, you know, male and female to to cause the eggs to grow. Wow. But you can see this stem was killed uh, from the cicada damage. And if you notice with our cherry bark oaks, you're, we're we're seeing a real thin canopy this year and, and a lot of tip dieback. And it's because the population of the centipede wasp is causing the twigs. The, the damage to the vascular tissue of the tree. How about that? It's, it's, it's pretty severe. I don't know what we're going to do about it. But you did say they were beneficial. They're beneficial in the fact that they, uh, they're a predatory insect and, wow. they, you know, but this is, they're not totally beneficial. <laughs> not totally beneficial. Yeah, for the uh, sake of our cherry bark trees, right. uh, they, they may affect the population, but, you know, it's, it's like everything in nature, it's going to run its course. Sure. And, uh, Maybe in the next two years, it won't be such a problem. Wow. I'm glad you brought those. 
Good yeah, example. actually, I found them on your property right here. <laughs> but I can find them on anybody's property. Anywhere, Anybody right. that has a cherry bark oak, it's not the only oak that they affect. They okay. affect all oak trees. All oak trees. It's just primarily in this area. It's the uh, it is the cherry bark oak. Okay. I'm seeing it on willow. It's in a water, uh, southern red. Not southern red. That's the only one that I haven't seen it on. But yeah, there's other oaks that it is. Yeah. All right, Wes, we appreciate that. That was good. Yeah. All right, Wes, Peter, we out of time. Thanks. Thank you. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.